When a new warship enters the Royal Navy, it is often seen as the culmination of a long program. Yet naval strategy is always about the next design, the next class, and the lessons learned from the present generation. For Britain, the commissioning of HMS Glasgow, the first of the Type 26 frigates, is not the end of a story, but the opening chapter of a broader narrative. While the Type 26 will dominate anti-submarine warfare in the North Atlantic and serve as the template for Australia's hunter class, London is already speaking of another ship, the Type 32 frigate. The project remains conceptual, but it illustrates the continuing ambition of the UK to expand its surface fleet and experiment with new technologies. The logic of Type 32 begins with numbers and affordability. The Royal Navy needs mass as well as quality. The Type 26 is highly capable but extremely expensive, displacing nearly 8,800 tons and costing more than 1.5 billion pounds per unit. The Type 31, derived from the Arrowhead 140, is a cheaper and simpler design intended to provide hulls in the water at a lower cost. But even that balance is not enough. The Ministry of Defense has repeatedly stressed that the fleet needs a class of ships dedicated to modularity, to hosting unmanned systems, and to acting as a test bed for the technologies of the future. This is the niche that Type 32 is meant to fill. While no definitive specifications exist, the broad outlines are becoming visible. The displacement is expected to be around 4,500 to 5,000 tons, significantly lighter than the Type 26. The combat system would likely integrate vertical launch cells for point and area defense missiles, but the real focus would be on space for unmanned vehicles. Concepts include deck space and launch facilities for rotary UAVs, bays for deploying unmanned surface vessels, and modules to release autonomous underwater vehicles. In other words, the Type 32 is intended not just as a frigate in the traditional sense, but as a mothership for the future of unmanned naval warfare. This represents an evolution in philosophy. The Type 26 is designed for high-end coalition warfare, hunting submarines, escorting carriers, launching tomahawks, and carrying advanced radar like CFR-2 when exported to Australia. The Type 31 is about presence, policing the seas, and providing enough numbers to keep Britain engaged globally. The Type 32 goes further. It anticipates a world in which drones and autonomous systems multiply the reach of every ship, and where modularity matters as much as tonnage. For the Royal Navy, the project is also about sustaining its shipbuilding industry. By initiating Type 32, it keeps design offices active and secures contracts for yards beyond the Type 26 and Type 31 runs. The question, of course, is how this links to Australia. Canberra is investing heavily in the Hunter class, which is essentially a customized Type 26 with the Australian CFSAFR-2 radar and a suite of American missiles. The Hunters are big, expensive, and designed to fight alongside the U.S. Navy in blue water operations. But Australia faces the same dilemma as Britain. How to balance cost, numbers, and technology. The Royal Australian Navy will eventually need to supplement the Hunters with ships that can perform patrol, presence, and experimentation roles without draining the budget. Here is where the logic of Type 32 becomes relevant. Australia is already experimenting with unmanned systems. The Ghost Bat Autonomous Drone for the Air Force and the Ghost Shark Large Underwater Vehicle for the Navy are two examples of cutting-edge programs designed to deliver effect without risking manned platforms. If the Type 32 becomes a mothership for unmanned systems, Britain and Australia will find themselves converging on the same technological frontier. Even if Canberra does not purchase Type 32s, it may watch closely how London integrates drones into frigate operations. Lessons learned in Portsmouth could inform choices in Osborne. This is more than technical curiosity. It is about alliance architecture. AUKUS is often described as two pillars, 
nuclear submarines in Pillar 1, and advanced technologies in Pillar 2. Submarines dominate the headlines, but Pillar 2 may in the long run be more transformative. Artificial intelligence, quantum sensors, cyber tools, and unmanned vehicles will change how wars are fought. If Type 32 becomes the Royal Navy's Pillar 2 ship, a platform built specifically to host, test, and deploy unmanned systems, then it could act as the bridge for collaboration with Australia's own autonomous projects. Instead of both countries developing in isolation, they could coordinate. For London, the benefit is clear. By exporting knowledge and perhaps modules to Australia, it keeps BAE systems engaged and maintains influence in Canberra's naval choices. For Canberra, the advantage is equally obvious. Instead of reinventing the wheel, it can adapt British experiments to its own doctrine, ensuring that the hunters are not alone in carrying the burden of fleet modernization. Type 32 thus becomes a link in the chain. Not a ship Australia buys, but a concept it can adapt. Yet the challenges are substantial. Type 32 is not yet funded. The Royal Navy must persuade the Treasury that another frigate class is worth billions when the country already struggles with budgets for submarines, carriers, and the future combat air system. Politically, Britain has to prove it can deliver the Type 26 and Type 31 on time before layering on new ambitions. For Australia, the budgetary squeeze is even greater. Submarines under AUKUS and the Hunter-class frigates already consume enormous resources. Canberra will not purchase Type 32s in the near term, but it could pursue a smaller domestic equivalent in the 2030s or 2040s. Strategically, the existence of Type 32 highlights a divergence of priorities. Britain wants to maintain a global navy that can experiment and innovate while Australia seeks a fleet capable of defending its approaches and contributing to coalition operations. The two visions overlap in important ways, but they are not identical. The Hunter is about blue water presence. The Type 32 is about modularity and numbers. The potential synergy is not in identical fleets, but in complementary development. Britain tests, Australia adapts, and together they build a broader AUKUS toolkit. Looking ahead, the significance of Type 32 is not in its displacement or exact number of missiles, but in its role as a symbol. It shows that the Royal Navy is not satisfied with current classes and is determined to keep innovating. It shows that Britain sees drones and autonomy as central to future warfare. It signals to allies like Australia that London is not only a legacy power, but a forward-looking partner willing to invest in emerging technologies. For Canberra, the message is equally clear. While hunters remain the backbone, the logic of Type 32 points to a future where cheaper, modular, unmanned-focused ships may be just as important as heavy frigates. Australia can take inspiration from this without committing to the same path. The lesson is that surface fleets cannot rely on one expensive class alone. They must diversify, experiment, and prepare for rapid technological change. In the end, Type 32 is not yet steel in the water, but it is already a strategic marker. It represents Britain's intent to extend the frigate story beyond the Type 26 and Type 31. It suggests a new avenue for AUKUS Pillar 2 cooperation linking the Royal Navy's unmanned ambitions with Australia's own Ghost Bat and Ghost Shark programs. And it raises a question that goes beyond technical design. If the Hunter class is the backbone of the Royal Australian Navy, could a future Australian Type 32 one day emerge as the complementary muscle, ensuring that the Indo-Pacific fleet is not just powerful, but also adaptive?